So now that we've kind of processed the ingredients, now we're going to talk about some of the specific uh, tools and resources that are available out there. Before we talk about some assemblers, I'm going to actually kind of do a quick detour, talk very briefly about what's called whole genome alignment. It's very similar to what you guys have done with, uh, say, read mapping, but some of the tools and some of the technologies are just a, enough different that I wanted to give some attention to this. Um, so like whereas, uh, I don't know, uh, Bowtie or BWA are very good at aligning short sequences to a reference genome. You know, even BWM does some funny things when you try to align, you know, the human genome to the mouse genome, you know, that sort of scale, or a de novo assembly of one human against the reference genome. There's really some different tools that you, that you want to be aware of uh, to, to carry this out. So we're going to detour into whole genome alignment just to kind of show off some of the tools that are there, and then we're going to come back and talk more specifically about the assemblers some of the data types. So a lot of these slides have been kind of stolen, borrowed from a really good friend of mine, Adam Philippi, he used to be at University of Maryland, uh, just recently started as an investigator at NIH. <clears throat> so the whole point of whole genome lineup is we're gonna have two whole genomes and we wanna basically line them up. Now in some cases, this is very easy where it's you know, the same sequence laid on top of each other, but there are gonna be all kinds of complexity along the way. So, here are two genomes. We, again, we want to do this lining up process, but we have to allow for lots of things that have taken place, right? There could be, uh, um, you know, a whole series of insertions, deletions, translocations, chromosomes getting fused, separating things. So it's, we want to do this in a global sense. We want to align one whole genome to the other whole genome. That's a, that's a global analysis. But the actual pieces have to be done in this local way where we're going to have this piece of this genome matches this piece of this genome. This piece over here matches this piece. This is sometimes called a G-local alignment, a global local alignment, just a little bit of terminology. So the types of things that we can determine from this are going to be you know, all, all sorts of things. So we're going to have simple substitutions. We can have inversions of sequence. We can have the deletion of, from one sequence to the other, the insertion, all kinds of uh, things that we're going to want to discover through these, through these uh, uh, processes. So the, one of the standard ways to just get started with this is going to be something called a dot plot. It's a, it's a very simple idea, but a very powerful uh, visualization. So what we're going to do is we're just on one axis. On the x-axis, we're going to write out one genome. On the other axis, we're going to write out the other genome. This is going to create a big matrix. So here it's just four by four, but if this was human versus mouse, it'd be like three billion by two and a half billion, something like this. And we're just going to fill in the cell if the character from one genome in that sort of corresponding row matches the character of the other genome. So A matches A, yep. A does not match C, does not match C, you know, C matches C, C matches C, T matches T. So this very simple idea, very straightforward to compute, is actually going to be very powerful to be able to see large scale patterns in the data. So one thing to notice, so if we had one genome against itself, we would have this nice strong set of uh, matches along the diagonal. We have a little bit of that here, I mean it's a short example. We have a little bit of that there, but then we have you know, rows where there's kind of holes in the alignment. That can be indicative of you know, substitutions, insertions, deletions. So we're going to be able to look for the diagonals and then also look at the off-diagonal things are going to be really informative about the mutation. So let's, let's walk through a bigger example. So imagine we had two uh, large genomes. Again, we're going to have one on the x-axis, one on, on the y-axis. Uh, if they were exactly the same, it's just going to form a long diagonal. Now in reality, also in addition to this long diagonal, there would be like a fuzz, and that's because, you know, let's say, you know, the first base here was an A. Any other place there was an A, there would also be a little tick mark. So there'll be like fuzz in the background of where, you know, just things happen to match with each other, but it'll be dominated by a long diagonal. We'll see kind of a, another example of that in a real genome in a second. Real, critically though, the, that sort of fuzz, we can quickly filter out. We're just going to look for long segments of long diagonals or, or anti-diagonals, meaning inversions. So let's imagine that there's, I don't know, uh, translocation between the two genomes. So just to give it some names, so A goes 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, B goes 1, 3, 2, 4, right? So on the A genome we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and then on the B genome we have 1, 3, 2, 4. We have that sort of swapping. <coughs> And as a result of that, you can just, you know, in one second, look at the plot, uh, look at the, the dot plot, and then anytime you see that, that pattern, oh, you just know that there was an exact translocation there. It's really, you know, powerful visualization to these data. 
<clears throat> so let's also look at, say, an inversion. Now, uh, you know, what we, what we have here is what used to be the sequence going one way. We're going to have the reverse complement of that. The reverse complement is going to create an anti-diagonal, and that's because while A is counting up, B is going to be counting down. So to get that to match up, we'll go anti-diagonal. If we have, say, a pure insertion, we're going to start on, on, you know, on the diagonal. Now, this is an insertion in A. So this is a sequence that exists in A that does not exist at all in B. So that means there's going to be a gap to the right, a jump to the, to the right here. And that'll mean whatever this sequence corresponds to down here is the sequence that was inserted uh, relative to B. Had it been the other way around where the insertion was in B, this, this, you know, this segment along the diagonal would have jumped up. That would have been indicating where the, the novel sequence is in B and then continue on uh, along the diagonal. So what's, what's great about these plots, right? So here's a very simple plot. You know, in one second, you can size it up. Oh, there's you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different segments. Oh, there's a translocation, uh, inversion, insertion you know, in no time whatsoever. So it's a really effective summary. It scales you know, pretty well, where this can be you know, many millions of bases by many millions of bases. You'll be able to look at this. It does get complicated when you're looking at you know, the whole human genome against another human genome. But you know, what you want is a tool where you can kind of zoom in and out uh, and look at this. There was a period in my life when I worked at Tiger when like all day long I was looking at these plots. I made this like cheat sheet that you can go ahead and download. And what's nice is, you know, in addition to kind of those, you know, simple events, you can have uh, more complicated events where, you know, for example, you have, um, you know, uh, a change in tandem duplication where here you have three copies of repeat get reduced to two copies. You're going to have these, you know, again, we're going to be focusing on how things move off the diagonal. And you can have various amounts of overlap. You can have uh, longer overlap, shorter overlap. So if you ever want to kind of you know, look at these sort of plots, I encourage you to check out this cheat sheet to help you sort of think through the process. Uh, things get really complicated when you look at real genomes. So here's two strains of Yersinius pestis. This is the nasty bug that, that uh, caused the plague back in the day. Again, you're going to get all these off diagonal matches that are there where there's going to be short repetitive elements that, that are present. If you squint at it, you'll notice that there's some, something going along here on the diagonal. It's just kind of hard to recognize. So many of the sort of tools that look at these dot plots will have various you know, sort of auxiliary programs that do various filtering. So in the package that I help work on called Mummer, we have something that will take that initial dot plot, clear up you know, all the sort of redundant repetitive alignments, and then you get a picture like this. So let's just kind of walk through here. So what happened here? Version. Yep, kind of walked along here. Another inversion, kind of walked over here. What, so what, what do you think happened here? That, that would be a good thought. Where, so it jumps to the right. So that would, that would suggest that this sequence is unique to this genome. But if you notice, it's exactly in line with this sequence over here. So what happened is the piece that lived over here, it's anti-diagonal. So it was inverted, and it moved into a different position. So it was an inverted translocation. Down here we have just a pure uh, inversion. Here's the other half of that you know, event, another kind of scenario of inversions, translocation, so forth. So here's you know, 5 million by 5 million bases that in three seconds we just sized up you know, uh, a million years of evolution taking place. So it's a very effective uh, tool. What about the top left and bottom right? Ah, so uh, many of the microbial genomes are circular. And if they're not exactly kind of lined up at the origins, replications of things, you can get this sort of donut pattern of the X pattern. This, is, this suggests that they're very closely aligned, but there was um, you know, maybe a little bit of uh, um, uh, adjustment need to take place. OK, so as we look at some of these uh, tools, we're gonna, I'll be showing you dot plots of some of the results. So that's why I want to introduce that concept up front. So I'm going to be sh shifting back into kind of the assembly world, talking about two uh, uh, widely used popular Algorithms. One is called AllPass LG. It was developed at the Broad. Uh, this is my recommendation for Illumina-only projects. Uh, it works really well. There are other uh, software packages for Illumina assemblies. Um, if you're really interested, the, the papers to look at were called the Assemblathon. This was kind of a bake-off of many different assemblers to see, you know, how well they performed. Uh, it is so. The first observation is that there is no assembler that was, you know, perfect. They all make mistakes. Furthermore, there is no assembler that is the best in every possible way you might be, be interested in. You know, some were able to produce longer contigs, but maybe they weren't all that accurate, or maybe some produce, were able to assemble genes better than others. So there's nothing that was perfect. AllPass does very well in every category. 
In addition, all pass is highly automated, where you just like give it the data, and then on the fly, it'll look at the characteristics of the data, do error correction for you, do trimming, try to incorporate the mate pairs very effectively, look at, it does like everything that you'd ever want to do in a very automated way. So it's my strong recommendation for Illumina projects. It's like my go-to uh, uh, resource. If you, you know, if you're really motivated, you can try tuning it, although uh, the sort of automated methods work really well. That's, it's a really good place to get started. If, you know, if you're looking at a totally new species, totally new clay to life, where you need a really high quality reference genome, that's when I really strongly encourage you to look at some of the long read technologies. I admit they're more expensive today, but it's just gonna give you a lot more power to look at the overall genome structure. The assembler that I highly recommend for this is called the Solera Assembler, invented at Solera back in the heyday, the Human Genome Project, but we've continued to maintain it for you know, almost 15 years now. Where, it's, where it works today with current data. You can uh, input uh, Illumina data into the Slur assembler, but you will get a bad assembly. It's, it's uh, not optimized for 100 base pair reads. It really wants things to be like thousands of base pairs long. In the same vein, you can, you can sort of load uh, long reads into all pass, but it's not really set up to that. It doesn't, it doesn't scale beyond microbes. So it's, it's kind of like two different, they, they use a lot of the same concepts, but they really are specialized for these two different scenarios and you really can't effectively uh, mix them together. Okay, so we're gonna go through just a few slides on AllPass, give you a sense of how it works, what it does, uh, and then we'll transition to the Slur Assembler. Again, a lot of these slides come from a good friend of mine, Ian, at the, at the Brew. So just like all other assemblers, the, the key input will be a set of different reads from different libraries, and we wanna take this into a, into a genome assembly. Along the way, there's gonna be a whole series of steps. Let me point out some of the most important ones. So, on the middle here is going to be, in the language of all pass, are going to be called unipass. Again, this is like that compressed de Bruin graph where we try to simplify things but before we've included any may pairs along the way. Uh, in addition to that, there's going to be kind of a bunch of stepping stones where we're going to start from raw data, do a bunch of processing, form that initial graph, and then do final scaffolding into the, into the final results. We're going to just look at a few of the key characteristics. One of the very uh, important characteristics for AllPass is that it has very specific requirements of the types of data that you have to input. Uh, in, in particular, it requires at least two and possibly more libraries. One of these libraries is gonna be what's called an overlapping pairs library. So this is gonna be two, uh, it's gonna be a pair done library where the two reads actually overlap. So, so say you've done, I don't know, 100, you're doing 100 base pair sequencing, you're going to pick it from, say, 180 base pair fragment, such that the, the tips of the reads will actually overlap by about 20 bases. You'd be like, Mike, this is a terrible idea. You know, we're just wasting money to have this redundancy. But, aha, if we know these two reads should overlap, we can merge them together up front, and then suddenly we have 180 base pair reads. Again, the whole business of assembly is overcoming repeats, and you do get, you know, a bit better resolution of repeats using 180 base pair reads instead of 100 base pair reads. Again, coverage is pretty cheap, so... Yes, you lose a little percent of, of coverage, but not so uh, extra cost. So that's library one. Library two is going to be at least one mate pair library on the order of 3,000 base pairs long. Uh, and this is going to be really essential for scaffolding. So we're going to build up this initial uh, compressed de Bruin graph called the Unipass. And then we're going to use the second library, the mate pairs, to try to be able to link together, resolve some of the ambiguity from the repetitive sequences. If you are able to get them, have the funding for it, you can also fold in you know, longer libraries. If you can get it, if you want to get a really high quality result, if you can create a 40 KB library, you'll get a really nice result. The only people in the world I know that make Fosman libraries regularly are at the Broad. Uh, it's, it's quite complicated, expensive, all these things to do, but you get a really nice assembly. We'll see some uh, results of that in a second. Again, kind of the one major requirement is we're going to take these reads that partially overlap. We're going to try to pre-merge them together. It's also going to look at other reads to make sure this merge is reliable. If you don't want to use the, the uh, all pass for this, there are some standalone tools that will do exactly this operation. The one that I recommend is called Flash out of Steven Salzberg's group. I wasn't part of it, but I know how it works really well. It does a, it does a really good job. That can be very effective for not only genome sequencing, but transcriptome sequencing for structural variation analysis. Just getting longer reads is, is, is really helpful for all these different assays. So once we have that, we're gonna build up the de Bruin graph, just like we saw with Charles Dickens, compress it down, uh, apply that scoring function to try to find long uh, contigs that we think are unique based on their coverage. Uh, so here I have just a few of these kind of in, in thin air. 
And then the, the, the next sort of major phase will then be to apply, um, you know, pick out the best ones. And then using the mate pairs, try to figure out, well, from this long big contig, what other contigs are kind of connected to this? It'll look at the coverage as a scoring function to try to figure out what else is unique. And then try to like, um, you know, grow out in this, in this uh, 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 process from the biggest and most confident to kind of less reliable sequence. Try to grow out these scaffolds to be bigger and bigger. Notice here there can be some interesting things happen where we're going to have this one contig. And we're actually going to have sort of uh, gaps from one contig to the next. If you ever looked at like the reference human genome where you see like n n n n n n n n n n this is where the assembler from mate pairs knows these two sequences should be next to each other, but there's like complicated repeats or gaps in coverage or whatnot where we don't know the actual base pairs where we're just going to put in ends in there to say to, to kind of space things out appropriately. Uh, and then we're going to do this many times, try to use other sequences to patch in some of those gaps, and then hopefully build out bigger contigs and nice uh, scaffolds. So this is actually a scatter plot. On the x-axis, we're going to plot scaffold n50 size. On the y-axis, we're going to plot contig n50 size. Again, this is like a, you can think of this as like average contig size, average scaffold size. The scaffolds here are measured in megabases, uh, contigs measured in kilobases. This is 19 vertebrate uh, genomes that all been assembled by Alpass, uh, Alpass LG. The kind of the major conclusions from this is, you know, if you have the right data, you have the right libraries, the genome is not so complicated, uh, you, you'll get results like this, where your contigs will be, you know, on the order of 10 KB, 30 KB, maybe if you're lucky, uh, 50 KB, something like this. And your scaffolds, if you're lucky, will be on the order of a few megabases. Some of these, you know, really uh, contiguous assemblies that have, you know, 20 megabase scaffolds, that was because they had that nice Fosman library that can jump over the really complicated repeats, link things together uh, really well. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit, talk about using all pass uh, for a couple of assemblies that, that I helped work on uh, a year ago, where we're looking at just to kind of mix. And so Maria already presented some of our human analysis the other day, so I'll talk about some of the plant work that we also do. So here we're looking at, there's thousands of different varieties of rice. Uh, we had picked out just three of these, ran all pass, got pretty nice assemblies. You know, contigs were pretty good. Our uh, scaffolds were not amazing. They're on the order of a few hundred KB. Again, we only had shorter jumping libraries, so no surprise that we weren't getting uh, mega base uh, scaffolds from there. Nevertheless, using uh, Mummer, that suite, we can align these two genomes to each other. And then often we'd see, you know, patterns like this, where we'd have, you know, in this uh, contig assembled from one of, the, one of the samples called Indica, you know, it would match very well this other sample, Ausch, but then there'd be these big regions where only present Indica and then continue it on. So when I first did this, I was like, oh, wow, you know, here's you know, many, many megabases that are specific to each genome. I was very excited about this. I bring this up only to be really careful, and that's because these were, you know, relatively low quality Illumina assemblies by kind of today's standards. In reality, a lot of these regions that seem to be only present in one genome or the other were actually just repetitive elements that were not particularly well assembled in one genome or the other. So you just have to be kind of really careful about this. If you want to, you know, really conclusively say, oh, this sequence only occurs in this genome, doesn't occur in this genome, uh, another a powerful approach is, is, is to use something uh, called Kamer counting. This is like a reference-free way to be able to assess the repeat composition. And then here I'm just plotting the, re the Kamer counts uh, of this particular sequence, you know, from the different species. So here we had good camera coverage across the way. We could see evidence for the repeats. You know, here we had a scattered, scattered coverage, but also gaps in coverage. So using that sort of analysis, that sort of coverage analysis, we can reliably find sequences that only occur in one species in the next. I don't want to go into too much of the plant biology. So what did we learn from this? So overall, uh, we had really good representation of the genes, you know, we had, uh, you know, almost all the exons assembled. We had many of the gene models that we expected to find were present. We found some interesting stuff. But really the key point I wanted to make is, you know, as we study this, the, the assemblies, act, oh, without fail, always get segmented at high copy repeats. This just always happens. Uh, as a result of this, we're missing a lot of the genome that we expected, just missing a lot of the import, most important features like transposable elements. And it was just really hard to identify all the, regulatory, all the regulatory sequences, things like this. So as a result of that, even though that first pass we applied with Illumina sequencing, we were actually gone back and done uh, pack bio sequencing um, to try to fill in a lot of those holes. And in particular, the way we're going to do this is going to be with the, the Solera assembler. So just to put some context on all of this work, there have been other sequences of rice that were, have been uh, sequenced and assembled. 
In 2005, the International Rice Genome Project in Nature published uh, the first ever rice genome. It was a variety called Nippon Bari. I really love this paper, especially this one table, table two, where, you know, they, again, very much like the International Human Genome Project, in a very systematic way, they were going through each chromosome, using BACs and other technologies to, to come up with it. I love that in this table, you know, they have each chromosome to the base pair of how long they are. They count exactly the number of gaps. There's 36 gaps in the sequence. You know, and they talk about, you know, how much of this represents. Insanely high quality, right? There's, they're, they're, you know, for a genome that's 400 megabases, you know, they put a lot of time and effort. And in fact, they put a ton of money also into this project. Even for a 400 megabase pair genome, 10 years ago, this was on the order of a $100 million project to be able to accomplish this, to get a contig N50 size of about uh, 5 megabases. So that was uh, 2005 when that was published. Uh, uh, we've been very interested to sequence rice. So you know, from short read sequencing, uh, we, we also you know uh, we also tried you know shorter 76 base pair libraries. We get kind of this mishmash of assemblies that are present here. Instead of getting contigs that are on the order of you know uh, megabases or tens of kilobases, we're getting you know sometimes contigs that are like on the order of a few hundred base pairs. Just kind of like gone through the paper shredder. And these examples, at the time, the total cost was like, you know, $10,000 instead of $100 million, so it's 1,000 times cheaper, but we're losing a lot of the value uh, scientifically. So that's when we're going to, you know, apply a lot of the new technologies. I know you guys have been, you know, talking a lot about uh, these throughout the course. But just to just remind you, you know, today there's, at, at, at many different levels, there's just all kinds of new technologies that are going to help with genome assembly and kind of related projects. Uh, we have things like the blue pippin that's going to do really good size selection. We have uh, flow cytometry to be able to pull out single cells or pull out single chromosomes. We have you know, super powerful sequencers now that can provide lots of coverage of short reads, long reads. We have some long range mapping technologies. Um, we have optical mapping. We have uh, various chromatin assays that can pull out all these things. All these technologies get used in, in new and creative ways. What's missing here is we also have really powerful algorithms now that can make sense of a lot of these uh, types of data. I know you guys have done a lot with pack biosequencing, so I'm not going to kind of walk through it. Uh, but just to, you know, to remind you, it's going to be a long read single molecule approach where we're able to collect a lot of data. So this is the histogram. So we, so we were very interested in rice. We are interest, very interested in this uh, uh, type of rice that hadn't been sequenced before. We had an OK I'll pass assembly from this, but we really wanted to put it together to come up with a really high quality assembly. So this is the histogram of reads that we had available. Kind of had the shoulder here little bit over 10 kb. In this data set, the longest read was about 50,000 base pairs. So those data are awesome for you know, genome assembly to have 50,000 base pair reads. Of course, the challenge with these data is they have you know, quite a lot of error in them uh, because it's a single molecule approach. When we, when we do this with controlled experiments of you know, say yeast and other species where we know what we think the right answer should be, uh, we think there's about 15% error. You know, it varies a little bit from sample to sample. The key thing, though, is it's dominated by false insertions. These are just like phantom bases that the, that the sequencer is going to pick up that don't actually belong in there. Um, the error rate is too high that if you just try to apply, you know, basically any of the standard tools out of the box, they're just not going to work all that effectively. We need some specialized tools to, to work on this. So the way that I think about this is, you know, genome assembly is like putting together this jigsaw puzzle from these long read technologies. We get these nice big, you know, tiles. The problem is, is they're all very fuzzy. So uh, when we first got these data, we almost, you know, we were really struggling to make sense of them. The thing that we have now, though, is we have automated algorithms that can take these fuzzy pictures, sharpen them up. It's like in, you know, Photoshop. We're going to hit the sharpen button, try to resolve the picture. So now suddenly we have nice sharp pictures, nice and large get clear resolution of what's going on there. Uh, a little more details on this. We we're very interested in, in how we can, uh, the spirit of how this correction work is we're going to take one of these long reads and we're going to compare it to other long reads in a very sensitive way. And we're going to try to take the consensus of all this data and then ask the question, well, is the consensus accurate? When we're first thinking about this, it's, you know, it's not clear that if you take a read that is 15% you know, error and then add another read that's 15% error, another read that's 15%, it's not clear that the consensus would actually be all that accurate. The key thing, though, is, is that the errors are dominated by totally random phantom insertions, so, so that at any, and at any given position, it's very unlikely that you'd have the same phantom base inserted multiple times. It's, it's just very uh, unlikely. So we measured this in real data. We, we 
came up with an analytical model, and it turns out that the error rate you know, falls off uh, generally in an exponential way, whereas with increasing coverage, as you get up to 10%, uh, excuse me, 10x coverage, 20x coverage, the error rate, which normally starts out at like 15% error, quickly drops to below 1% error. Uh, there's been reports of uh, error rates on the order of one in a million bases. So even though the data starts pretty noisy with enough coverage, with enough algorithms, we can clean this up into, into almost nothing uh, in terms of error. The algorithms that are, ver that are available today come from a pretty big spectrum. Uh, and it's all driven by how much coverage you have available. At, at the kind of the high end, if you have large amounts of coverage, the, the most effective strategy is to take those long reads, compare them to each other, build up a consensus of that. That's been, that idea has been published a few times. The first time was HGAP in Nature Methods. More recently, there's a new kind of optimized algorithm called MHAP that was published in Nature Biotech a few, a few months ago. If you don't have high coverage where you can compare the long reads to each other, kind of an intermediate strategy is to use hybrid approaches where we're going to combine, say, packed bio coverage with Illumina coverage and try to put this together. Same sort of idea. We're going to take long reads, align short reads, or an assembly of short reads, and use that to be able to resolve the errors. At low coverage, say 5x coverage or maybe 10x coverage, there, even if you had perfect error correction, it's not really practical or possible to do a de novo assembly with only a few x coverage because of that Poisson sampling. So instead what we're going to do is, so let's imagine we have, you know, say an all-pass assembly where things are pretty well put together in the scaffolds, but you have gaps. We have NNNNN. Let's use those long pack bio reads on top of that to, to give you at least a draft sequence of what uh, should be present there instead of just, uh, you know, a series of ends. So these are, you know, there's available, it's a very uh, active uh, uh, development uh, uh, community where there's lots of new algorithms, lots of new uh, software available. If you're really interested, I encourage you to like, you know, check out the PacBio website. They keep really up-to-date resources available. They don't, you know, they want their customers to be successful in all the projects. So they'll really work with you to make sure you comply the, the best algorithms. Okay, so going back to that distribution, uh, we had about 10 x, excuse me, we had about 50 x coverage of reads over 10 kb, about 6 x coverage over 20 kb. Again, the max was about 54,000 uh, base pairs. That's before error correction. After error correction, we, we kind of ironically, we threw away all the reads that were really short. And by really short, I mean we threw away all the reads that were below 8,500 you know, base pairs. It's kind of remarkable that, you know, from half of my contigs from the all pass assembly were like not even that long, but we're just going to. We're going to throw them away. And this is a summary of the results that we get. So from the all-pass uh, recipe that we saw before, we get about 20 kb. Even using you know, a little bit longer MySeq fragments, these are like uh, 2 by 250s pre-assembled into 450 base pair reads, get about uh, 20 kb contigs. So using those error correction routines, using the uh, Solaris assembler, instead of getting contigs that are on the order of you know, 20 kb, we're going to get contigs that are on the order of 4 megabases. Uh, just to put this into perspective, uh, you know, that, that reference that cost $100 million was uh, about 5 megabases. So we spent, you know, if we were to do this experiment today, this would be about, I don't know, $20,000 worth of sequencing that gives you quality that is on par with $100 million from a few years ago. This is really transformative when you start thinking about uh, novel species. So this is, you know, this is interesting from a statistical, you know, just from the stats here. But I thought it would be useful to kind of drill down and ask the question, well, what does it really mean to have you know, contigs that are 4 megabases instead of you know, 20 kb? So one of the features that we're interested in is uh, in rice, it turns out that if you try to breed together certain varieties, uh, only certain types are compatible with each other. There's a, there's a locus that controls this. And the, it's, a, you know, it's, it's broken into about uh, half a dozen different segments. Uh, each on, on the order of a few hundred base pairs long. But these segments can vary by just like one critical base pair or two critical base pairs. Uh, so what, I, what I've done here is I've taken <clears throat> the consensus sequence from PacBio of one of these critical segments. Here's I have one of those critical bases where you really want to know this base because this is going to determine if my breeding experiment is going to be successful or not. So that's the PacBio, exactly matches the Illumina. We also did Sanger sequencing because it was so important, exactly matched. So we, you know, at the base pair level, again, this is all built out of reads that have about 15% error. In this region, we had 100% accuracy compared to our Sanger validation, compared to our Illumina validation. It was a perfect representation here. So this is just, I don't know, 100 bases or so. Let's step back and give us uh, not just 100 bases, but here's 100,000 bases of context. 
And what I'm showing here is in, in this sort of gold color is I'm showing where I've, I've successfully aligned uh, Illumina contigs to my pack bio contigs. So this means I have an Illumina contig. Oh, I have no Illumina contigs. I have no Illumina contigs. Over here, there's this black region, no Illumina contigs. And we were very interested, well, why do we, you know, we had more than 100x coverage from Illumina. Why are these, why are these, these regions where there's, no, where there's no coverage here? So in this plot, I've tried to estimate the copy number of the, of the genome using that Kamer counting approach. And the, and the kind of the main observation is, is in these regions where we had gaps in the Illumina coverage, where we just had no context there, all corresponded to regions where we had, in this case, like 100x, uh, these are re repetitive elements that occur like 100 times in the genome, just really poorly assembled. The assembler, in fact, they assembled so poorly that the assembler just like totally left them out of the output. As a, as a practical thing, uh, all paths won't report contigs that are shorter than about 1,000 base pairs. So it was like in one of these auxiliary files that you don't even ever look at uh, was the sequence that should have gone there. So this is about 100 KB of context. So let's step back. I, I, didn't, I didn't specifically uh, cherry pick the biggest contact. I was just interested in this, you know, this S5 locus, S5 locus where we wanted to know that base pair sequence. But let's step back and look at the whole contact. <clears throat> so that going from 100 KB, it just so happened to be that this contig fell on a contig that was about 5.3 megabases. So again, it's the same scenario where in orange, I've plotted out where I had Illumina coverage at really high fidelity. And then in black, I've ticked off where there was just no Illumina contig to align there. So what do you get from going from a 20 KB contig N50 to a 4 megabase uh, contig N50? Well, number one, you go from kind of a Swiss cheese representation of the assembly into this really beautiful contiguous representation. Uh, we've got about a total of about 20 megabases of additional sequence in the pack bio assembly. It's, you know, again, it's not just like this chromosome arm was missing. It was just like millions of these small regions were missing from the Illumina assembly uh, that all add up to about 20 megabases. Considering the genome size is only about 400 megabases, this is pretty sub substantial. As far as we can tell, the sequence identity is extremely high. We filled in thousands and thousands of gaps. We corrected many hundreds of misassemblies. Now we've been able to go back and do annotation. We get much better gene models. You know, we get regulatory elements. We get to actually look at how the chromosome structure compares to other uh, varieties of rice that are out there. So this, it's not just been in rice. You, know, you guys heard the other day, been really successful in human doing this. Just, uh, I don't know, two or three weeks ago in Nature Genetics, we published pineapple. We have, you know, Asian sea bass under review, other species under review. So I, I've been working with pack biotechnology on, I don't know, dozens of projects. And it's kind of the same punchline every time. You know, started with this really complicated scenario, apply this much longer read technology, apply the right algorithms, get these beautiful results, giving us much deeper insight into the underlying biology. It's all been driven by this curve. This is a curve of the average read length from PacBio over the last you know, uh, uh, seven years or so. Uh, every six months to a year, there's a new chemistry that more or less doubles the read length. In the early kind of dark days, you know, the reads were not particularly short. When the first instrument was commercially available, they, they just took a lot of heat because you know, frankly, it just wasn't working that well. Uh, the reads were not particularly long. They had a huge error rate, but we've, we and others have stuck through this curve and now suddenly we're getting in a very routine read, in a very routine way, reads averaging over 10,000 base pairs, you know, getting a lot cheaper, faster, all these things. Uh, correspondingly, we're getting just, we're being able to move from, you know, our first experiments looking at yeast, things like this, getting perfect microbial sequencing. Now we're up into the stage where we can more or less give you like, I don't know, you want a perfect Drosophila assembly? Okay, well, that'll be $10,000 in two days worth of work. You know, it's just like incredible how fast we can move on these things. We're, not, we're certainly not yet at the point where we get perfect human genome assemblies. Uh, this has been a question that we've been asking, you know, where on this curve do we need to be where we're gonna be able to get you know, a perfect human out of, out of the box? We're still you know, several years away from this. By our projections, it's gonna, we need average read lengths to be around half a million base pairs. So uh, we hope that we're gonna continue on this exponential curve. Also now there's all these long range mapping technologies that can start to produce not reads of that length, but maps of that length that are, that are quite exciting uh, to be able to piece together these chromosomes. So what should we expect from an assembly? Which, what do I recommend you do? Again, if you really want to really carefully study genome structure uh, in terms of all the genomic elements from genes to regulatory sequences to transposable elements to you know, overall larger structure, I really strongly recommend PacBio sequencing. Uh, 
for genomes up to about 100 megabase pairs in size, which includes a lot of model systems, you're going to get basically perfect chromosomes or perfect chromosome arms. It's still tricky to get the centromeres on some of these bigger genomes. For larger genomes, you're, I've, I've, I've been witness to this many times. We're going to get content again 50 sizes in the megabases. Uh, when you're talking about human genomes, even today, we're starting to get content again 50 sizes in the megabases. The key challenge today is these, these data are expensive, but they get cheaper all the time. PacBio has a new instrument coming out next year uh, uh, called the SQL that should make it about $15,000 to sequence a human genome, which is admittedly more than Illumina, but considering the scientific value that you can get, uh, is, is quite practical for a lot of different studies. I know you guys have also talked about nanopore sequencing. I have a whole separate talk about that. We've been very active with that. We have hybrid error correction strategies, very much like I described today. The challenge is the throughput is just not there. So we've been able to get like perfect assemblies of yeast, but if you wanted to scale us up to do sequence human, it would take like a year of sequencing and hundreds of thousands of dollars just because of the throughput. We look forward to the fast mode and we look forward to the Promethean that should, you know, uh, make this more competitive, but just to set your expectations. It's a super cool technology. I love being able to like show off having a sequence in my pocket, but uh, the reality is, is it's just not practical for large genomes today. Okay, so summary. So, the key characteristics for assembly are coverage, 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 repeats, 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 and read length, read length, read length. The error rate, I, I know I said this was really important, but in reality, random sequencing errors, not such a big deal. We have Really robust algorithms, even with the nanopore at, I don't know, 30% error, we can effectively do the error correction. The process is hierarchical. We're going to start from, you know, really fine-grained details, looking at kamers or how reads overlap, build up initial contigs, then we're going to add in mate pairs or optical maps, other data, go up another level of the hierarchy so we can get big scaffolds. We hope that these big scaffolds will resemble chromosomes. If not, you need something like optical maps or genetic maps to be able to tile this out into chromosomes. Uh, we have to be uh, really careful that you know, we don't get too aggressive in this process. Otherwise, we're going to screw up all the repeats in particular. They will either be left out or have extra copies that can, can really confuse things. Uh, so this, this has been you know, the work of my lab and a lot of great friends and collaborators. Uh, so what I'll do is we'll take, I'll take questions now. And then we can take a short break before we flip over to some of the exercises. So questions. Um, one question is, so what do you think about the, you know, the areas of the human genome that still are gaps? Like segmented duplication. Yeah. yeah. yeah how, how does that, so is it, are we going to have to wait until the pack fire rates get longer to get those? Uh, so we're chipping away at them. Uh, there's a great paper out of Evan Eichler's uh, group last, uh, when was this? end of last year where they used pack bio sequencing on human to try to fill in some of those gaps. They were quite successful. They closed about 40% of the gaps. Um, the challenge though is, is quite successful means we're closing the smallest gaps that are present. As we want to get you know, these perfect genome assemblies, you know, it's, it's, we have to wait for the technologies to catch up. We're going to have to use combination of technologies. Um, I, you know, it, we're, we're on that path, but, it, but it's taking time. I do think it's remarkable that now, you know, using pack biotechnology for, you know, a few tens of thousands of dollars, we're going to close gaps in the reference that's been worked on for like a decade. So I think it's, it's, a, it's just an awesome time to be in genomics where these technologies exist. Other questions? Uh, going back to the beginning of the talk, you mentioned, so you had that uh, Dickens text. Mm -hmm. And so it starts off with a capital letter. So how do you place that in the genome to start? Ah, so I mean, it, this is an analogy, right? So, yeah, but how, it, yeah, how would you so in the in the in you know in English there are clues about the beginnings of sentences, but in you know in the genome there's not really a clue. Is it random? Uh, not 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 particularly random, uh, so much as you know the the algorithms will will either pick a sequence arbitrarily or um, you know look at coverage, you know look at things like that to be able to try to the starting point. The other clue in this example was. In that first fragment, there were no other fragments that overlapped the beginning of it. So that can be a good clue that something starts here. So the assemblers will use you know, clues like this. But I don't understand. So it was with DNA, where would you start? You'll just, you, you can start anywhere, right? So you can, you can start in, in the middle, work one way, and then turn around and work in the other direction, right? Especially in the case of DNA sequencing, you're, you, you, you know, the, the strand of the sequence you pick is arbitrary. So the assemblers are always, you know, always kind of working in this sort of dual-rolled 
Well, they'll, well, they'll simultaneously try to assemble the forward strand and the reverse strand. But you can, but you can, really, you can really start this process anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which I think these difficult regions contain, but they are not enriched in them because they're repetitive. You know, they're less likely to be disease-causing genes. In yep. Uh, yep. Uh, you know, do you think that um, we're going to need to, to 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 you know use the pack bio long reads to set to fill these gaps, establish a reference, and then and then still be able to use short reads for for you know disease variant identification, or will we really need to do the long reads for also for you know will we need to uh, uh, do this kind of long read whole genome sequencing uh, for disease variant detection all the time. Yeah, so a uh, couple um, uh, uh, key points. So, I, so I've been a big fan of pack bio sequencing. Um, uh, how do I put this? So if we imagine we're 100 years in the future, my prediction is, is there'll basically only be long read sequencing. Either the pack biochemistry will be working really well or the nanopore technology will be working really well. It's a, such a critically important um, uh, problem to be able to do sequencing. Like every technology you could possibly imagine has been attempted from, you know, to, to try to sequence DNA. So I'm very optimistic in the long term that uh, there'll be technology will exist that if it doesn't give you whole chromosomes, just zips through, you know, these huge segments very efficiently. So, so, the, so right now we're just kind of in this transition period where Illumina's sequencing in particular is like super cheap, so there's, there's a motivation to use that for population scale. Uh, but uh, uh, my, so kind of answer part two of your question, I do believe there's going to be really important variants that, we, that we're going to need to use the long read technology for. So you heard from uh, Maria, you know, if we're using, because of the long read technology, we were able to detect on the order of like 10,000 structural variations that were just like totally missing from the short read data. Do we, do we know, you know, for all 10,000 of these, are these functional? No, of course not. I mean, it's the, we're, the, we're the first people to ever do this. It's not until we build up big catalogs are we going to really be able to say how important that they are. Uh, it's certainly the case that structural variations do play a big port, uh, important role in diseases. It's well established now that certain copy number of variations have been associated with autism, schizophrenia, things like this. So it's totally, you know, it's 100% certain that they'll be important. We just don't know exactly how important. So I think in the, in the short term, it's going to be very practical to establish a, a handful or you know, maybe hundreds of really high quality reference genomes. Uh, us and others are really starting on this process. Whereas the reference genome today is like, you know, 70% one random guy in Buffalo. You know, let's have really high quality rep references from different sort of ethnicities around the world. And then today it's just very practical to then using those references, let's overlay, you know, short read sequencing to look at population dynamics. Uh, that's, I think that's going to be our, uh, you know, kind of our destiny for the next several years, um, just, because of, just because of the cost. Good question. 